tonight, leaders on message as your vote speeds closer. What they're saying about minority government. The party with the most seats forms the government. Rosie and at issue are here to sort it out. Atlantic Canada feels the blast of a weather bomb. Alberta's oil and gas wells, why the money is in shutting them down. And the U.S. and Turkey strike a deal. The United States and Turkey have agreed to a ceasefire in Syria. Diplomacy aside, our team in Syria shows the reality on the ground. This is The Nation. With just three full campaigning days left, federal party leaders are trying to keep on message. But in a race this tight, there is another focus. What happens if no one wins a majority? For the leaders today, that was a hot topic. Thanks very much, everybody. Yeah. Thanks for all your yeah, thank you. <laughs> so as they made the round, shaking hands, pausing for photos, they were either dodging or diving right into talk of how a minority win would play out. So tonight, we will look at how the three main federal parties dealt with it, starting with Katie Simpson and the Conservatives. Andrew Scheer is gearing up for a new fight that may drag on well past election day. The party that wins the most seats should be able to form the government. But it's not necessarily that straightforward. In a minority situation, parties with fewer seats could team up to try to form government. Scheer would know that since he sat as Speaker of the House for four years. Nevertheless, he persisted. A prime minister who enters into an election and comes out of that election with fewer seats than another party resigns. That is a, that is a modern convention in Canadian politics. Here's what Liberal leader Justin Trudeau said to Peter Mansbridge about a possible minority situation in 2015. The way it's always, always, always been. Whoever uh, commands the most seats gets the first shot at governing. Well, it's not always the way it's been. I mean, they're, That's pretty they're, much always. A, whoever well, gets the most seats gets the first shot at trying to command the confidence of the House. Well, actually, the first shot goes to the outgoing To, to the party. outgoing Prime Minister, absolutely. Scheer's comments today suggest Conservative internal polling has the party poised to win the most Thank seats, but not enough for a majority. All that was his topic of choice today, but he was nearly knocked off message during a grilling on same-sex marriage. I've been with my partner for 25 years. How is our marriage different from yours? Well, look, uh, I've, I've made it very clear that uh, Canada had a debate as a society. We had uh, two elections where this was an issue. We had uh, two votes in the House of Commons. Uh, society's moved on, I've moved on. It's not in my place, it's not my place as a person, as a human being, to judge anybody else. Though the public polling shows a tight race, Sheer and his team behind the scenes appear confident heading into the final weekend of campaigning. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Little Harbour, Nova Scotia. I'm Salima Shivji with the Liberal campaign, where Justin Trudeau is on a two-day Quebec swing to try to stop the Bloc Québécois' momentum. Le Bloc n'a pas le monopole sur la fierté québécoise. The Bloc Québécois doesn't have the monopoly on Quebec pride, he says, a line he repeats stop after stop. Bonjour. Bloc leader Yves-François Blanchette enjoying his moment, not at all phased or surprised by his newfound support. The Quebec nation has decided to be proud and to demand respect. On va se retrouver avec un gouvernement conservateur. The pitch from Trudeau in the dying days of this campaign leans into fear of conservative cuts if, hypothetically, the conservatives win. But he's steering clear of all other hypothetical questions about what he'd do in a minority situation, sticking very much to his script. Uh, given that in a minority situation, the prime minister has the first right to govern, do you intend to use that right? I am focused on electing a strong, progressive government that will continue the fight against climate change? Or do we go back to Stephen Harper's austerity and cuts with the progressive opposition? The choice Canadians are facing is a very, very clear one, and we are entirely focused on that. A classic strategy from a leader trying to stay in power. Talking about working with other parties at this stage negates Justin Trudeau's final plea to frame this election as a contest solely between his progressive liberals and the guy on the right, Andrew Scheer. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Montreal. I'm Hannah Thibodeau with the NDP, which today visited the Blue Star Diner in Welland, Ontario. How's it going, Welland? 
It's become a favorite campaign stop. Justin Trudeau visited in the 2015 election. Hello, Niagara! Well, Justin had that rock star status. It's a smaller party than the other ones. So, but NUP's big and well in there. Singh was asked about Andrew Scheer's claim that if the Conservatives win a minority, the Liberals and NDP better respect that and let him form government. We don't respect Conservatives now. We're going to always fight Conservatives because we don't believe in their cuts to services. That sings message that he'll do whatever he can to stop Andrew Scheer from becoming Prime Minister. And he told voters not to believe that coalition is a dirty word. It's not. <laughs> if you have new Democrats, whether we're in government, which I'd love to be in government, please let that happen. Whether that's in opposition, whether that's working together with others, whether that's in a coalition, whatever it is, I want Canadians to know if you vote New Democrat, you get fighters, you get fighters, you get people on your side. This is Singh's last rally in Ontario before Election Day, and he's expected to spend the remainder of his time in British Columbia, where the NDP are fighting some tough three-way races. Dana Thibodeau, CBC News, Brampton, Ontario. And of course, this being Thursday, you will hear Ad Issues take on the final days of the campaign. Rosie will be here with Chantal, Andrew and Althea. That is in about 15 minutes. And a minority government in Britain is spelling trouble for the latest Brexit plan. Today, Prime Minister Boris Johnson secured a new divorce deal with the European Union, complete with unanimous approval from EU leaders. Some thought that would be impossible. But as Renee Filipponi reports, that might have been the easy part. After days of uncertainty How are you feeling, gentlemen? and last-minute negotiations, Prime Minister Boris Johnson arrived in Brussels with a deal. It's a, a reasonable, fair outcome and reflects the uh, large amount of work that's been undertaken. Both sides had to compromise to end the latest Brexit stalemate. It protects the rights of our citizens and it protects peace and stability on the island of Ireland. The New Deal will avoid a hard border between the Republic of Ireland and UK's Northern Ireland. The Prime Minister of the Republic supports it. Still there will be no tariffs on trade between North and South and no checks along the land border, uh, which is crucial uh, from our point of view. Enthusiasm for the deal in Brussels is all well and good, but if politicians here won't support it, it doesn't matter. MPs will get a chance to vote on the deal this weekend, but it's unclear if Johnson will be able to get the support he needs. As it stands, we cannot support this deal and will oppose it in Parliament on Saturday. And it's not just the opposition threatening Johnson's deal. His key ally, Northern Ireland's Democratic Unionist Party, is also opposed. In order to avoid trying to get an extension, he has been too eager by far to get a deal at any cost. With a minority government, Johnson needs their votes in the House. Anything could happen. This Brexit analyst says it's impossible to predict what will happen on Saturday. The UK and the EU had reached a deal before, um, and at the time, the Prime Minister Theresa May had promised that she would be able to get it through Parliament and, and failed to do so. By law, Johnson will have to seek a delay if it fails. But in Brussels today, there is no interest in that. For the EU, its job here is done. Now it's up to Johnson to take it across the finish line. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, London. To the U.S. right now, where the White House admitted it had used foreign aid to pressure Ukraine to investigate Donald Trump's political foes. So, so the demand for an investigation into the Democrats was part of the reason that he it was on the to withhold funding to Ukraine. The, the look back to what happened in 2016 certainly was, was part of the thing that he was worried about in corruption with that nation. And that is absolutely appropriate. Yeah. Okay, so Mick Mulvaney seemed to refer there to a theory that Ukraine meddled in the 2016 election for the Democrats. Donald Trump raised that in a July phone call with Ukraine's president, and that call is now driving a Democrat-run impeachment inquiry. Today, Mulvaney seemed entirely unapologetic. I have news for everybody. Get over it. There's going to be political influence in foreign policy. But the White House later walked those statements back, saying aid to Ukraine was never conditional on an investigation into the 2016 election. 
Now, the Trump brand of diplomacy is also playing out in northern Syria. Kurdish fighters there once fought side by side with American soldiers, but tonight they are on their own, facing a five-day window to flee or else. The ultimatum, part of a deal brokered by the U.S. and Turkey. As Paul Hunter tells us, it appears to leave the Kurds out in the cold. Said Turkey today, we got what we wanted as Turkish-backed fighters in northern Syria who'd been part of the onslaught against Syrian Kurds celebrated the pause in the violence brokered today in Ankara. Today, the United States and Turkey have agreed to a ceasefire in Syria. It's a five-day break from the Turkish assault announced by the U.S. Vice President. In that time, Syrian Kurds, the former U.S. allies, abandoned by U.S. forces last week on orders from the U.S. president, must now leave their land in northern Syria. It's to make a so-called safe zone along the border with Turkey, which sees the Kurds as a threat. Donald Trump will abandon plans to sanction Turkey, though Democratic lawmakers say they'll press on with their own regardless. Indeed, the U.S. retreat in Syria was again labeled a betrayal by Trump critics, among them, it's again, nice even senior honor. Republicans. What we have done to the Kurds will stand as a blood stain in the annals of American history. This is an amazing outcome. Today, Trump underlined the assault that began when U.S. forces left would likely only worsen. It was going to be very nasty. Not only sanctions and tariffs, the war itself would have been very nasty. With Russian flags now seen flying in places formerly controlled by Kurdish and U.S. forces, Trump explained the threat of a longer, horrific war was itself an impetus for peace. You would have lost millions and millions of lives. They couldn't get it without a little rough love, as I called it. Said Trump, it's a great day for Kurds and for civilization. Adding the big state dinner planned for next month in Washington for Turkish President Erdogan is still on. Erdogan said Trump is a strong, tough man and a hell of a leader. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. While the U.S. struggles to contain violence with diplomacy, it has already exacted a price on their former allies. For years, the Syrian Kurds had their own de facto government in northern Syria. Margaret Evans shows us firsthand how Kurdish political dreams are being directly targeted. In northern Syria, a town mourns a lost daughter, the chant on their lips that martyrs never die. And a mother stands to remember her, even though the manner of her death carries such a heavy weight. These are the friends and family of Hervin Halef, the Kurdish politician was taken from her car and murdered last Saturday, along with her driver and an aide. Shapal Mustafa is her cousin. I'm very angry. Why? Why all of this happens to us? Only just because we are Kurdish? Halep's killers are suspected of belonging to one of the Arab militias unleashed by Turkey to fight on its behalf. Her mother, Sawud Mohammed, does not shy away from the brutality of it. They could not even show her body to me, she says. There was not any part of it without bullets. They even pulled out her hair. Her family wants the world to know about it and what's happening in Rojava, the autonomous Kurdish enclave wedged between Iraq and Turkey. The Kurds of northern Syria are not only dealing with devastating human loss, they're also faced with the potential loss of the dream of Rojava. Derek's town center is unusually quiet. Conflict keeps people indoors. And convincing people here that the promise of a ceasefire will be kept will be difficult. We don't trust anyone. Not Erdogan, not Assad, not America. Because all of them give and gives us and gave us a lot of promises, but they went back. Those mourning Hervin Halef expect there will be more grief to come. Margaret Evans, CBC News, Northern Syria. Back to Canada now and the state of the Alberta oil patch, where this year more wells are being closed up than new wells are being drilled. Kyle Back shows us how that is driving business in a province waiting for another boom. 
It's a sign of the times. Oil field workers decommissioning or closing an old natural gas well instead of drilling a new one. But these days in Canada's oil patch, a paycheck is a paycheck. When I first started working the rig, you, you were busy all the time. And now if you get two weeks in a month or sometimes a week, you do pretty good. After several years of low oil and gas prices, this type of work is helping keep some service companies afloat. It's the only growing business in the oil patch, although it too is hardly thriving. It is tougher on the margins. People don't want to spend money on the dead horses, but uh, um, you know, it helps us get through these tough times. There is huge potential for the decommissioning business. Western Canada has nearly 140,000 inactive oil and gas wells. The longer they sit, the higher chance of leaks and other environmental harm. Still, the price tag can deter some producers from taking action. Sometimes the, the complexity and, and cost is not, is not known. And so the, the, there has been a backlog of, um, of well abandonment site cleanups. At least one industry group has lobbied levels of government to relax some regulations. Others want an investor tax credit, both aimed at spurring more cleanup efforts. With so many people out of work, they argue the timing is right. Which is a win-win uh, because cash is injected into the system, the environment is cleaned up, and some of those many unemployed oil field workers can get back to work uh, doing something that's very important in our society. With oil production expected to be stagnant, instead of drilling new wells, this crew will continue to abandon old ones for the foreseeable future. Kyle Bax, CBC News, near Stetler, Alberta. We're back in two minutes with this. Why a growing number of sports brands are pushing products infused with cannabis. And later, people in Nova Scotia took a seat in our voters' chair and told us what election issues matter to them. A new report raises questions about the promise of legalized cannabis in Canada. It has been exactly one year and legalization has not worked out quite as planned. Statistics Canada says only 29% of Canadians who buy it do so from a legal source. But even if they all wanted to get it legally, there's a shortage of retail stores and then there is the cost. While the legal price averages $10.23 per gram, the competing black market rate $5.59 per gram. Today, round two of legalization kicked in for edibles, part of an alternative cannabis market worth nearly $3 billion. It's not just gummies and brownies, though. As Jacqueline Hansen tells us, sports drink brands want in on the action. Brooke Henderson, Team BioSteel. BioSteel's original drink is backed by some of today's most well-known Canadian athletes. I drink the paint. This product is, is our original pink drink. Co-founder and ex-NHL player Michael Camilleri says it was developed as a healthier version of a sports drink. Now the company wants to add a new twist to the mix, CBD, a cannabinoid derived from cannabis or hemp that doesn't get you high on its own, but some say may help with pain and anxiety. Within pro sports, the stigma is gone uh, and I think quickly dissipating everywhere else to the point where CBD will be looked upon as, as a health and wellness product. But there are still questions about the supposed health benefits, effects and safety of CBD-infused products. The research that, that's out there is completely in its infancy. We know probably a lot more about THC than we do about CBD, uh, but we know very little about either compound. Out of the air, into the end zone. The NFL is doing its own research to see if CBD is an effective alternative for managing pain. But for now, it's off limits to its athletes. It isn't illegal, according to the World Anti-Doping Agency, but WADA still warns against using it in case it's cross-contaminated with banned substances like THC. It says, despite manufacturers' claims, to our knowledge, there are no CBD oils with absolutely zero THC. Clearly, we need to do uh, some good research, I think, before I would make any recommendation, particularly to professional athletes. Marijuana producer Canopy Growth is behind the new line of BioSteel products. It bought a majority stake in the company and is providing research and hemp-derived CBD. It says the amount of THC would be so minimal that it couldn't be detected. If the products meet Health Canada's new regulations, BioSteel expects them to be on the market by early next year. 
Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Toronto. Among the other stories we're following tonight, some 30,000 Quebecers are still without power after heavy rains and winds pummeled the southern part of the province today. At the height of the storm, nearly 110,000 homes and businesses were left in the dark. Heavy winds toppled those trees, taking hydro poles down with them, even crushing some cars in Montreal. Flooding in some parts of the region is expected to continue throughout the night. And a BC Mountie is calling for faster treatment for RCMP officers who are struggling with PTSD, saying the support system is broken and in crisis. Staff Sergeant Jennifer Pound has been off work since being diagnosed with PTSD in 2017. She claims she didn't receive prompt help from the RCMP and she fears other officers won't receive the support they need either. So she is calling for the system to be rebuilt from the ground up. First responders are taking their own life and I can tell you that it's because of desperation. Public Safety Canada says more money will be spent on assessing officers for PTSD starting next April. And Swedish climate activist Greta Thunberg will be met by counter-protesters in Alberta tomorrow. United we, we Roll, that is the truck convoy that traveled to Ottawa in February, says a similar convoy will make its way to Edmonton in time for Thunberg's planned climate rally. The group says Albertans in the oil and gas sector are frustrated with celebrities visiting the province. Stay with us. Rosie is coming up with the last ad issue before Monday's election. So fasten your seatbelts. Chantal, Andrew and Althea have a lot to say. This week, Justin Trudeau is desperately trying to salvage his job by doing a coalition deal with the NDP. But this is the coalition Canadians cannot afford. Canadians need to pull together and pick a progressive government, not a progressive opposition. Whether we're in government, which I'd love to be in government, please let that happen. Whether that's in opposition, whether that's working together with others, whether that's in a coalition, whatever it is. The election campaign is in its final stretch and the possibility of a minority government seems very real. So how are the parties positioning themselves? At issue is here for the last Thursday before Election Day. Chantal Lebert is in Montreal. Andrew Coyne is in Toronto. Althea Raj also in Toronto tonight. Okay, certainly the closest race I have ever uh, witnessed and obviously the, the positioning around the, uh, the, the likelihood that this will be a minority has been interesting to watch this week. What has, uh, what has struck you, Chantal, about the way leaders are positioning themselves? Um, I have uh, to say that uh, I found the Conservatives a bit hard to follow. At the beginning of the week, Andrew Scheer was saying we're going to have a majority. Uh, by today, he was saying whoever has the most seats has the right to govern, which seemed to go the other way. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm not convinced that the best approach to uh, sealing this bargain with voters this year is to talk of a majority government or to say, to talk about the first hundred days of a conservative government uh, or to say we'll be repelling the carbon tax because the, the conservatives can only win next week if the vote against them splinters between the NDP, the Liberals and the Bloc. If you're giving more and more reason to voters who are still soft to say maybe we should stick with Trudeau by saying things like that, maybe you're not on the right strategy. Hmm. And, and Andrew, if Canadians feel that they need a government on a shorter leash, which is generally what a minority government is, maybe continuously saying you want a majority government isn't the way it works. Although a conservative said to me last night, how do you ask for a minority government? You don't do that anyway, So, I don't, which is fair. Well, there's two factors at play. There's the one factor that Chantal's talking about of keeping the vote, the non-conservative vote, uh, splintered by being non-scary, but there's also the factor of, of turnout and making sure you excite yeah. your base, uh, get them thinking about things. Some people are going to be scared of the prospect of a conservative government. Some people are going to be scared of the prospect of a liberal minority propped up by the NDP and or the Greens. Uh, so it, I agree, it's not conventional. Uh, it's, so one possibility is they haven't thought this through. One possibility is they're thinking of things we haven't thought of. <laughs> Althea, what do you think? Or they're not sure what they should be thinking, yeah. I think, is probably what explains the Andrew Shearer, um scenario different messaging and frankly Jagmeet Singh's different messaging yes. um, 
I'm not sure that the argument we heard from Stephen Harper in 2008 about how coalitions were illegitimate and the argument we heard in 2011 that you had to vote conservative to prevent the NDP from forming government propped up by the liberals is going to work this time because you have a liberal uh, incumbent government. And so if you are scared of the possibility of an NDP liberal coalition, why wouldn't you just vote liberal? Um, and I think maybe that explains some of the kind of walk back that we've seen from Mr. Shear and some of the walk back that we've seen from Jagmeet Singh. Mm -hmm. But it, it kind of seems like they didn't expect reporters to go down this route, which yeah. is odd to me because we've been going down this route for the last several elections. Um, <laughs> so it, it is interesting. I will say, sidebar, yeah. it does bother me a lot when we have our political leaders talking about how coalitions are illegitimate and kind of misleading the public about how our system actually works. Yes. I don't think that's what our political leaders should be doing. Well, well can I play this Andrew Shear clip around the, the party with the most seats gets to govern? Because this is another issue that, that tends to make some people crazy. Um, so Here's, here's how, what he said about it again today. It is clear that in modern Canadian history, the party with the most seats forms the government, and that a prime minister who comes out of an election with fewer seats than another party resigns. So, Chantal. Yeah. Um, uh, I think that maybe Mr. Scheer, when he has a spare moment, should call former BC Premier Christy Clark. No, she is not from another century. She was the Premier of BC. In 2017, she actually won the most seats uh, by two, tried her luck uh, getting the confidence of the Assembly in Victoria, did not, and last time I checked, the NDP, John Horgan, uh, uh, have been in power since then. Or if that's too recent, we could go back to 1985, eight, really ancient history in a revolutionary province called Ontario, <laughs> where the incumbent won 52 seats, the conservative incumbent, the liberals 48, and I was there for that, I hate to admit. <laughs> and uh, Mr. Miller, is the name of the premier then, tried his luck too, did not uh, get the confidence of uh, the House, and David Peterson became the premier. So those are not examples from some forgotten constitutional era that Mr. Scheer, as a former Speaker uh -huh. of the House of Commons, would not have had access to. But presumably, Andrew, he's not saying that because he doesn't know. He's saying it because he doesn't want people to consider or, you know, he wants to make things difficult the day after or the night of. He wants, yeah, he yeah. wants to, as you're saying. <clears throat> as a matter of convention or constitutional law, he's completely wrong. As a matter of optics and practicalities and arithmetic, it will depend <laughs> on the numbers. Yeah. So right now, if you look at the, con at the, at the projections, they're looking at roughly tied both parties in the low 130 seats. But supposing it comes out with the Tories with 140 and the Liberals with 125, to, for the Liberals to form a government out of that, they'd have to get the support of not only the NDP and the Greens, but yeah. also the Bloc. Yeah. That's a pretty rickety contraption, and it would be, they'd have to think twice about whether they wanted to form a government in those circumstances. But that's a matter, as I say, of practical politics, optics, and, and what, what can actually be done rather than constitutional convention. But if we're, if we're looking at, you know, four seats, five seats, I don't know what the bar would be, but just a number of seats, you could, you could, you could see how Justin Trudeau might make that case. Could you not, Althea, that because he is the incumbent, he gets to try and test the confidence? I think if he only needs one <coughs> other political party, like if the NDP has a substantial number of seats and that the seat count is very close between the Conservatives and the Liberals, then it makes sense to me because, frankly, I think a lot of Liberal voters would want that to happen. A lot of new Democrat voters who are possible liberal switchers in the future would like that to happen. Um, and when you actually look at where the parties align themselves in their agenda, I mean, the bloc is toxic for the sovereignty reason. But in terms of their agenda, so much more aligns. I mean, the, the Greens, the bloc, the NDP and the liberals are like on one side on most issues and the conservatives are on the other. And so I think the public would want them to try to form some sort of arrangement. Yeah. And if it doesn't work, well, then the public has spoken, right? And then we yeah. let Andrew Scheer, and it, obviously this is all hypothetical, but yeah. also, try, and then possibly but, we go back in another election. Don't tell them, Andrew, yeah. But there's also uh, the issue of um, Mr. Scheer's capacity, if he ends up with a minority government, of actually surviving the first yes. confidence vote. This week, the Bloc Québécois made it clear that it would not support the uh, repelling of the carbon tax. Yeah. That is the position of the NDP and the Greens. So unless Maxime Bernier brings a lot of friends to the House of Commons to help Andrew Scheer, uh, or Jody Wilson-Raybould suddenly uh, wants to join the club that doesn't believe in carbon pricing, which I very much doubt, uh, you could have a conservative government with 15 seats 
more than the liberals still not manage to have a viable government. The one thing that would govern everyone's calculations is partisan self-interest. <laughs> uh, you don't say. <laughs> and, this is, and this is how Stephen Harper was able to, to continue through minorities, even, the, even though he had all his parties against him, is when all three parties, or in this case all four parties, have to, have to pull the lever together to force an election or to bring the government down, uh, it's not always the case that they're, they will see their interests aligning at the same time. When one party is up in the polls, another party is down the polls. The crucial period would be in the short term. Because if they were to bring him down immediately, then you, all kinds of possibilities would open up. The longer they wait, if it were to go six months or a year, then you'd be looking at an election and part, one party or another might have reason to say, oh, you know what, we, we don't want to have an election just now. The thing we learned from the 2008 coalition, uh, imbroglio, whatever you want to call it, uh, is people tend to punish whichever party, whichever side looks like they're overreaching, looks yeah. like they're too hungry for mm -hmm. power. Yeah. Uh, and so that's one of the constraints that all the parties will be having to, to, to un work under. And the other is, uh, uh, maybe the same point is, of not a asking too much, not demanding too much in, re in return for your support. So if anybody thinks that any one party is going to have the absolute whip hand, they all are, are going to be under the watchful eye of the public. And if any of them look like they're being unreasonable, they will pay a price. I would just say that there is an overarching issue that is urgent for most of those parties, and that's climate change. And so even if it seems like they're acting in their own partisan political interest, they can say, actually, we're acting because we think we only have 11 years to go to address climate change. And so you know, great circumstances call from greater action. And mm. so this is why we're perhaps taking extraordinary steps in yeah. working together than we would otherwise. And I think that might be a, a powerful argument for the public. OK, can, can I end on, uh, you know, so we're almost at the end, uh, four days to go. Um, <clears throat> Did, did you think that we would still be this close? I mean, I, Andrew and I were talking before about uh, the last time it was this close, I'll, so I'll let Andrew go first, but did you think we'd be this close? Uh, no, I mean, who knows? I mean, <laughs> it, 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 I've never seen an election in my memory where the two main parties were so close all the way through the campaign. Remember back to, to 2015, where all three major parties were at one point or another in first, second, yes. and third. There were yes. wild swings in the support. This time, both of them have basically been on a slow fade, maybe a, maybe a rather faster fade for the liberals than the conservatives. But uh, I, I can't recall seeing something quite as static in terms of the relationship between the two major parties. Althea? I, mm, I think if you go back a year, I did not think it was going to be this close. At the beginning of the campaign, though, I don't know. It's been such a weird election with yes. so many bizarre curveballs. Um, that I'm, I'm not surprised, actually, that it's so tight. And you felt that the summer, like, crisscrossing across the country, talking to people, just the kind of the hatred for the prime minister was really palpable. But, you know, a year ago, two years ago, we thought Justin Trudeau would be cruising to re-election. So it, it has been fascinating to watch. Chantal? Well, uh, yes, uh, Althea is right. Over the summer, you would hear a lot of uh, the anti-Trudeau rhetoric, and it was deep. Uh, but... Uh, and no, I, what I didn't expect in this campaign, I expected more indifference to Andrew Scheer than hostility. But what I've picked up over the past three weeks, and it goes some way to explain why they failed to thrive in the polls uh, against the liberals, is not the great liberal campaign, but the sense that uh, Andrew Scheer, uh, in all the debates that he's participated in, has not managed to inspire enough trust in enough voters mm. to get where he wants to go. This is an election that both major parties basically lost. I mean, they're, they're both, on present forms, going to come under 33% in the polls. Mm -hmm. That's never happened before in our, in our history. Okay, so on that sad note, <laughs> even before the election, Andrew's saying everyone's lost. Uh, thank you all. Before we go, I do want to remind you that these guys will, of course, be with me Monday night for live coverage of all the results and analysis. I'm very grateful that they'll be there. Uh, here's a sneak peek of our election night set. Check it out. Canada Votes 2019 begins at 6.30 Eastern on CBC Television, CBC News Network, CBC Gym, the CBC News app, cbcnews.ca. There's, you can find us everywhere. See you there. And there's more campaign coverage still to come. The voters chair is on the move again. Tonight, Nova Scotians take a seat and tell us what's on their minds. Throughout the election campaign, we have been traveling across the country asking Canadians to take a seat in our voters' chair and talk about what matters most to them. So tonight, we're in Nova Scotia. Uh. All right. <laughs> 
What matters most to me this election? Oh man, that's a good question, isn't it? I'm just a regular old self-taught artist, pretty normal Nova Scotian girl. But I have really big dreams for the future. I want to see our country tackle things like the crisis with the environment that's been going on. Personally, as someone who's recently on Canada Pension Disability, I cannot imagine how people have been surviving and staying in homes. Why the, why the homeless population in this country isn't through the roof with senior citizens. It's time they stop saying, yeah, we're going to do something about it and just do it. Honestly, I've, I've lost a lot of faith in some of the leaders and the political parties. So honestly, nothing really matters. I'm probably not even going to vote. Focus more on the Maritimes. We seem like we're little people to you because we are not rich provinces. We need help down here with our Medicare system. My husband has been diagnosed with a serious illness. We pay over $500 a month, some months, in medications. Well, I'd say what matters most to me is that uh, politicians with guts, politicians that would stand shoulder to shoulder with the people. You got a big job ahead of you. Better be shovel ready. In this election, I'm very undecided who I want to vote for. I would like to see um, some issues for, um, for seniors, because I'm a senior, and uh, sometimes they forget about seniors. <laughs> Done? Yes. I hope I'm not on this show. When is it? <laughs> And as we head into the final weekend of the campaign, Peter Mansbridge has something special you will see tomorrow night on CBC Television. I'm hitting the road, heading cross country to meet people like you. <laughs> Good. I thought you were just killing a bug earlier. <laughs> well, welcome to Kelowna. Lovely to meet you. Ruth? Yes. Simple four-letter word. <laughs> <laughs> I want to hear what gets you out of bed in the morning. Looking for better jobs. Yes. That is my culture. That's who I am. What keeps you awake at night? I could easily have ended up homeless. Then we're like, oh, and maybe civilization as we know it is not going to survive. What do you think about the message you're hearing on the campaign trail? I wouldn't trust these people with my girlfriend's drink at a bar. This is the way you see it. Next summer, Tokyo 2020 on CBC, Canada's Olympic and Paralympic Network. I'm Jamie Poisson, and tomorrow on the CBC's daily news podcast, Front Burner, with just days to go before the vote, the second of a two-part series on the party's platforms. This time, the Conservatives and the Greens. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back. Despite fierce opposition, Venezuela has won a seat on the UN Human Rights Council. The country will begin a three-year term on January 1st. The Human Rights Council was created in 2006 to spotlight abuses and monitor countries. Several groups opposed Venezuela's candidacy on the grounds that the government of Nicolas Maduro is guilty of starving, torturing and murdering its own people. And a chaotic scene on London's subway today as angry commuters clashed with climate activists who were disrupting rail services during the peak rush hour. So that video shows the moment a group of commuters had enough in the English capital, dragging an Extinction Rebellion protester off the roof of an idle train and chasing another before dragging him off as well. London's mayor condemned the group for causing unacceptable disruptions. And in Washington, politicians on all sides stopped to honor their colleague, Elijah Cummings, who died suddenly this morning. All of us in this house lost a respected colleague. Many of us 
lost a dear, long-time good friend. There was a moment of silence for the 68-year-old who spent nearly a quarter century working in the House of Representatives and championing civil rights. His office said he died after long-standing health challenges. Straight ahead, another casualty of climate change. It is one of Nova Scotia's major tourist attractions. Now the window for those famous fall colors is shifting. Well, isn't that ugly? The season's first weather bomb hit Atlantic Canada today, bringing with it fierce winds and pounding rains. Nova Scotia was particularly hard hit. Trees weakened last month by Hurricane Dorian took another beating. Many toppled onto power lines and caused outages across the region. Exactly what's happening right there. A tree hits a power line, causes it to arc repeatedly. The last arc causes the power to go out. Heavy rain, high tide and storm surge also led to flooding along the coast. So that storm is obviously bad news for tourists and the industry they support. People from across Canada and around the world descend on Cape Breton's Cabot Trail to take in the oranges and reds of the autumn leaves. But as Kayla Hounsell shows us, not just weather but climate change is having an impact. Every year, fall leaves draw tens of thousands from more than 20 countries to Cape Breton Island. They come for the colors and the music. This festival is called Celtic Colors. I'm from Philadelphia. I'm from Michigan and we have color, but we don't have tremendous vistas of color. As visitors flock to the trail, a researcher from St. Francis Xavier University is studying how climate change could impact the timing of those colors. They have a camera overlooking the valley. Lindsay Spafford is taking us to one of her research sites. She has cameras all over Nova Scotia, taking pictures of 300 trees every day to monitor the changing colors. We have been observing in, in the last few decades that uh, in the spring, leaves are uh, coming out earlier and earlier. Spafford is partnering with the Department of Natural Resources, sharing data to study the impact of air temperature and humidity on tree growth and the various stages of the leaf life cycle. Extreme weather is also a factor. Hurricane Dorian is being blamed for the brown pockets on some parts of the island this year. And the leaves are moving around rapidly. They might sever some of the leaf veins that transport water and nutrients to sustain the leaves. So we might see uh, a quicker process going from green leaves to brown leaves. We are concerned because we lost quite a few leaves then. And the CEO of Destination Cape Breton says understanding the timing of the fall colors helps tourism operators determine the timing of their season. We've been trying to encourage people to open a little bit longer, um, but if the leaves aren't there, that may impact uh, people coming to visit. For now, they're still coming, still capturing those spectacular colors. I have like 20 pictures of trees in my phone now, you know. Like the music, the colors are part of the culture here. That's unlikely to change, even if the timing does and the tourism season is forced to adapt. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, on Cape Breton's Cabot Trail. The Paris Zoo has unveiled a new exhibit, and while we don't really want to give away too much just yet, feast your eyes on the blob, a biological oddball you'll learn all about in the moment. That's next. At a zoo in Paris, a bizarre creature that has baffled and amazed scientists for decades will now go on display. So this thing is weird and it has people talking and it is tonight's moment. Before the blood curdling threat of the blob. So its scientific name translates to the many headed slime, but the zoo simply calls it the blob. The most horrifying monster menace ever conceived. Named for the creature of the 1958 horror classic, the blob certainly defies easy definition. Alors le blob est un, un être vivant qui fait partie des mystères un petit peu de la nature. Yeah, no plant can crawl at four centimeters an hour, eating everything in its path. If you cut it, 
it heals within minutes. Even more remarkable, despite having no brain, this blob seems to know things. Mais c'est un comportement d'animal. Il est capable d'apprendre. Merge two blobs together and they transmit knowledge between them. So yeah, hold your loved ones tight tonight. This town is in danger. The blob goes on display at the Paris Zoo Saturday. Okay, and so this blob has no mouth, no stomach, no eyes, yet it can still uh, detect and digest its food. And here's my favorite weird detail. It has 720 sex organs, but no brain, of course. I have no idea how they know that. That is a national for this Thursday, October 17th. Good night.